Well, good morning, everyone. It's always a tough, uh, tough gig when you've got the first one after the cocktail evening, but um, I'm going to give it my best go today. As, uh, as Andrew said, well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, David, for having me here today. As Andrew said, I'm not a, not a lawyer, um, so if there's any legal advice to be given today, um, feel free to contact one of our partners at, uh, at uh, Asher's and not me. I'm also not an accountant, so although I worked for Deloitte, I was in the risk advisor area, so neither of those things I'll be able to take uh, any kind of depth of questions on today. Um, however, I do have a passion for risk, as, uh, as Andrew said, and so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is not only risk, but also how risk can be looked upon as a significant opportunity um, and not just uh, something for organizations and businesses to shy away from. Um, I, I, have a, I do have a doctorate, but I'm not going to chalk and talk you to death today, and if anything, I'll go through this presentation fairly, fairly quickly and then open the floor for some questions and some discussion. I think that's the most important thing today is to start talking about some of the cases, what we call cases in conversation, um, and giving you the opportunity to kind of dig into some of those topics in more detail, which are certainly significant topics, um, both nationally and globally right now. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today, the Yugambi um, language, language group, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So decarbonization, net zero. These are advisory opportunities. And one thing that Asherist recognized about two years ago when we were looking at some of the pillars um, for our organizational growth was that although um, the legal team was providing some amazing um, legal-related work in the space of decarbonization and net zero, such as putting together contracts or, or deals um, or M&A around um, things like big um, wind farms or solar installations or, or large batteries, as we've seen across the country and globally, um, there was a big opportunity for us to be able to move into the advisory space from a risk and strategy perspective. So not providing legal advice, but being able to dig down into some of the advice that's provided by the lawyers and actually operationalize that for our clients. Um, that was recognized uh, you know, as a significant growth pillar for Asherist, and Asherist Risk Advisor was formed from that, which has brought together a number of different, um, I guess, specialty areas, everything from cybersecurity through to the area that I work within, which is, um, which is uh, ESG. Um, used to be called sustainability. I think everyone's probably heard that term for, for a long time. Um, in the past few years, uh, particularly driven by the financial markets, it's uh, morphed into really a narrative or a language that's used um, to explain uh, things like non-financial disclosures of such impacts as social and environmental impacts for a company or, or for a society. Uh, and that's really morphed into that concept of ESG and the way that um, that language is kind of used to um, look at, particularly from an investment perspective, look through the lens of, of ESG at, uh, at investments, um, both nationally and globally. So I'll go through right now just a little bit of 101. Um, and what I wanted to do is start just by, that, by looking at that concept of net zero and decarbonization. And I'm sure people are not you know, shying away from hearing that on the Financial Review every single weekend and seeing it in the news just about every day. Um, it helps when we've got massive, uh, I guess, cases you know, coming into the courts around uh, challenges to do with, with, uh, with net zero and, and carbon. Um, we had our first uh, greenwashing um, prosecution by, by ASIC, a, a fine that was provided to an energy company just recently. Um, and those fines are now uh, being increased as well. So we're seeing some teeth come behind things like uh, misleading and uh, deceptive um, uh, disclosures that are, that are coming out from companies, which is obviously a legal, uh, you know, a legal term, but is certainly being prosecuted in the case of uh, public appeals as well. Um, but basically, net zero is this concept of either balancing, um, and in some cases, going beyond the amount of carbon emissions that are, are uh, produced by, by a company. Um, and these are what are called anthropogenic carbon emissions. And anthropogenic is just a fancy term for, for human. Um, and basically, things like uh, carbon emissions that are being produced by um, you know, scientific things such as photosynthesis and, and uh, you know, the natural environment for many, many years are not considered part of that, that type of carbon accounting or, or net zero um, pathway. What is are those things like um, electricity production, the burning of coal, fossil fuel use, etc. Those things that are driven by human-induced changes are really what are considered part of the net zero um, pathway. And so what companies are really trying to do right now is find a way to be able to um, balance their carbon accounts in such a way that they actually become um, carbon neutral. And that's effectively what net zero is really all about, is getting to a point where the amount of carbon that's produced by whatever activity you have as your main um, production measure uh, is, is negated by the amount of carbon that is, is taken out of the environment through a bunch of different means. 
And some of those include some of the ones that are on here, such as um, improving the energy efficiency of the product or the energy intensity of the product that you might produce. So let's say um, for every ton of steel, reducing the amount of um, uh, carbon emissions that are, are produced in the, uh, in the um, development and production of that steel, um, right down to the actual uh, purchase of carbon offsets. Um, such things in, in Australia as the Carbon Farming Initi Initiative, which allows companies to um, effectively sequester carbon in large, large tracts of, um, of agricultural land or, or uh, forestry production, which are ways that they sequester carbon and then produce a carbon offset or carbon emission reduction. So there are a whole bunch of different pathways for organizations right now. The big challenge is that there are so many different pathways that they could take and so many different options that strategy and, um, and I guess the risk profile of organizations are changing very, very rapidly. And you would have seen this in the news just recently, um, obviously with AGL as a, as a very big example of uh, where, a, you know, a, although it was driven very much by an activist um, uh, named Mike Cannon Brooks, who I'm sure you know the name of, um, that really came from being targeted as having a net zero or decarbonization pathway that was not considered to be credible. Um, now, uh, many people have different opinions on whether it was credible or not, um, but in the case of, uh, of, public, of the Court of Public Appeal, um, the, uh, that you know, was prosecuted pretty heavily in the news and across, uh, you know, across the globe and was identified as um, you know, a significant impact and risk for the company, and that led to the, you know, obviously, dropping of the demerger. So you know, those types of things are now becoming board, massive boardroom issues and significant strategic directional issues for, for companies that are, are changing the way they actually have to operate and run their business. So where did this come from? A little bit of 101. Um, this is not a new concept, the idea of, of decarbonization net zero. It's, being, it's been driven since the, actually since the 1970s, but in the recent, you know, about the last 30 years, um, we've seen a real change in um, global, uh, global regulation and global, the global drive for a change in the way um, companies actually operate from an environmental and social perspective. UNFCC, um, which was really the first driver back in 1992, um, this global framework, the idea was to create a, um, a language and a uh, policy set that could be utilized um, globally to be able to drive uh, down the, the amount of greenhouse gas productions, uh, production on a both national and global level. We moved into Kyoto Protocol in 97, where we actually uh, came up with a, a, what's called the Clean Development Mechanism, um, which is a way for you to be able to globally trade um, in these carbon credits. And that, that ran quite successfully for, for a number of years. At one point, Australia actually had a surplus of credits, um, and uh, still does, actually, on, on paper, and is able to trade those credits to reduce our uh, nationally determined contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well. And then the Paris Agreement, which is obviously the most contemporary version of this, which is really um, uh, you know, a, a list of different um, obligations, however non-requirements, non um, for countries to be able to um, delve into the idea of reducing carbon emissions uh, much more significantly and identify global or national, I should say, pathways that um, would lead to a global reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And right now, as we're, as we're sitting here today, um, what's called COP, or the Conference of Parties number 27, is occurring over in Egypt. Um, where they're now talking again about the Paris Agreement and they're trying to understand the trajectory that the, um, the world is on in terms of um, uh, decarbonization. The concept you probably would have heard is that um, 1.5 degrees of warming and the reduction below that um, is under, you know, under science, scientific review is necessary for the world to be able to get to a point where we actually um, don't see uh, the massive negative effects of things like rising, rising temperature, rising um, heat waves, rising um, cyclones, rising um, you know, seawaters, et cetera, all of those things that are going to cause um, some significant issues across you know, global supply chains and, uh, and global development and growth, which is obviously a huge challenge right now. Over 200 nations agreed to cut their, cut their greenhouse gas emissions and signed up to these, these national determined contributions, um, and those are now being measured on a global basis. This past year, uh, countries like Australia actually submitted their first NDC reports um, and provided uh, provided the you know the global uh, you know the global audience with an understanding of exactly what they are committing to and how they're on a trajectory towards a reduction in in carbon emissions. Now, there's a lot of language in behind this. Um, the basics behind how you you know determine what a carbon um, a carbon register would look like are these scope one, two, and three emissions. And I wanted to just stop here and just probably give you the main point of this entire talk today and any questions that I get and the way that I'll answer them. 
And that is that your businesses that you advise, and every single business that's out there, is going to sit somewhere between scope one, two, and three on the value chain for either themselves or some other business within their, their broader supply chain. And so every single business, regardless of how big or how small, will be impacted by um, the, decarb the decarbonization megatrend. It's, it's undeniable, and, and um, it's something that, that will not change. It'll only accelerate over the next few years. But regardless, they will sit within a scope one, two, or three. And three I'm going to really focus on today because it's the most nebulous and the most challenging for businesses globally. But they will sit within this value chain, and they will have to find ways to be able to decarbonize themselves. Scope one is basically things like burning diesel at a, uh, let's say it's a mine site and they've got a diesel generator that runs the, um, the gen set runs um, their mining equipment. The actual burning of diesel on that site is considered direct emissions or things that are directly emitted at the site or the point of um, production. Scope two are those things, um, well, mainly things like electricity, steam, heat, and power um, that come up the pipe or from somewhere else but are used within a business to, uh, to create its, its production value. Um, and that's things like coal-fired power stations, um, the use of gas you know, in, our, in our network for production of steel and, and various other uh, heavy industry. And scope three is everything else. That's why it's nebulous. Um, and there's upstream and there's downstream versions of scope scope three. And I'll, just to give you one example, um, anyone who flew here from somewhere else around the country today, um, that was an upstream emission into, into whole Chadwick's business, effectively. So the carbon emissions from your flight um, would be considered an upstream emission. Um, any of the products that would be, let's say it's a, um, a piece of advice that you might give, you're a bit difficult because you provide services, so it's a little bit uh, more harder to uh, kind of give you an exact example of, but um, let's say it's someone producing a widget of some kinds. So any of those widgets that were then sent to a company were then used by that um, uh, business. So let's say it's a glass water bottle, the water bottle was, or the glass, let's say a glass wine bottle was used by the wine company, produced wine, the wine was then taken home and then consumed. That then produces a scope three emission as well when it's disposed of at the end of its life. Um, and if you can imagine that scope three emission is exceptionally hard to, to quantify and to measure and to monitor effectively. So scope three is probably about the most complex area that you can, you can deal with, but it's very rapidly becoming part of the way that um, many large organizations, large companies plan and the expectation that they put on um, anyone within their value chain and their supply chain. So the person who produced the glass, um, that, that, or the, let's say transported the bottle, all of those people sit within that scope three downstream supply chain and could be part of uh, an accounting exercise, um, a non-financial accounting exercise to identify for Wolf Blast or whoever the, um, the wine company might be, what their scope three uh, downstream emission profile might be. So you're getting the point here that there's no one that really escapes, no business that really escapes from one of these scopes. Major players um, globally are you know, driving pretty hard behind decarbonization. Um, Asher's does work with all of these, all of these companies, um, either in risk advisory or in legal or in both in some cases. Uh, every single one of them has set a net zero ambition through to 2050, and the, the net zero you'll hear is usually, usually 2050, albeit some uh, states in, uh, well, there's a state, Tasmania, that um, has already surpassed its, its, um, its net zero requirements and are actually trying to produce up to 200% of renewable energy in, its, in, in the country, uh, sorry, within the state, to be used not only within the state but also outside of the state, be, to be uh, exported out. Um, but groups like Rio Tinto and BHP are also driving very hard at this net zero target. So they, for them, the production of um, whether it's you know, a ton of ore or a, a ton of steel, um, for them, things like elect purchased electricity is, is exceptionally important in their decarbonization objectives because right now in Australia and where many of these, these, let's say, BHP and Rio Tinto have you know, facilities in, in Queensland and Western Australia are heavily relying upon on things like coal fossil fuels, which are highly um, carbon intensive fuels and, and lead to a higher um, emissions intensity per tonne of steel or per tonne of coal. So these guys are actually investing very heavily in um, uh, renewable technologies, in hydrogen, and all of those things that you're reading about to find ways to put downward pressure on their emissions profiles. And so it's become really, really big business. And AGL, again, is a great example of that, where they were asking questions of, um, sorry, the, these types of companies were asking questions of AGL as a major supplier of electricity, of how they could help them to put downward pressure on their emission profile. Um, and AGL didn't have the best answers at the time.
that's challenging for an organization. You would have seen in the news, uh, Origin's just been lobbed a, um, a takeover bid um, by uh, uh, Brookfield, Field, and uh, you know they've, you know that's probably gonna that's gonna get moving pretty quick. I think we'll see that that's been that's been had you know it's come out at a, a much higher multiple than um, than we looked at for for AGL, and it's it's probably the bid that was the original bid um, in the whole kind of uh, uh, campaign to get uh, get your hands on a big energy asset. So I think there's some exciting areas in that, and that's gonna drive Origin's decarbonization journey fairly quickly, and from that it's gonna drive. BHP, Shell, or any buyer of gas or, or um, energy products, it's going to drive them towards being able to put downward pressure on their, on their energy profile as well. Groups like Amazon, I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. I just wanted to highlight one area in here that um, is often not talked about, but groups like Amazon are also driving pretty quickly towards their decarbonization objectives as well and, and making some major commitments around um, power purchase agreements for 100% renewable energy across their uh, distribution centers, so buying buying up as much renewable um, as they possibly can to be able to operate those those centers, and also moving into things like renewable fuels, biodiesels, um, you know those synthetic fuels that come from things like waste or biomass that allow them to be able to put uh, downward pressure again on their emissions intensity for their transport fleet as well. The one I wanted to point out just down the bottom there is uh, nature-based solutions. So um, you may have heard recently of something called uh, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, which is effectively a language and a bunch of principles that investors and particularly banks, the financial institutions, are using um, to be able to uh, verify their climate, climate objectives and disclosures. There's also just been released a, in the last about, uh, about 10 months, the uh, Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures which is actually looking at the value of a liter of water out of a, um, you know, a water source or the um, value of a ton of, of um, uh, biomass out of a forestry plantation and how you can actually, how those actually have to be valued throughout uh, as an ecosystem service throughout this, um, this, this larger kind of value chain. So suddenly we're also seeing companies like, um, like Amazon investing in looking at how they can actually um, produce more or keep more value within the value chain of, uh, of nature, of our natural environment. So it's really expanding in terms of the, the, um, uh, the non-obligatory um, uh, drive of different companies to try and do things that actually benefit social and environmental um, good, which is, which is really, really changing and has been the last year or so. Groups like uh, Telstra as well, you know, things like reducing absolute emissions so they're putting downward pressure on um, the actual uh, carbon intensity of, of things like their, um, their data centers and, uh, and the, you know, the infrastructure that they build and use across Australia. So driving towards things like the equivalent of 100% of consumption by 2025 completely from renewable sources, which is a really interesting space. In Australia, um, I was just reading a report and looking at groups like Amazon and Telstra with big footprints, growing footprints in Australia in the case of Amazon. Um, Right now, we're in a deficit, really, of renewable energy or, uh, projects over the next kind of 10 to 20 years. So we're at a point where there are so many claims on net zero and decarbonization and 100% renewable energy that we actually don't have enough project flow to be able to deal with the volume required to be able to get to that point for all of these companies. So we're going to get into an interesting, interesting space pretty soon where we're, we actually don't have the amount of solar or wind or pumped hydro resources available to us, or they're not built fast enough to keep up with some of these commitments. Um, and that's, that's, a, you know, that's a pretty, pretty kind of hairy place to get into when you're a business and you're trying to be able to demonstrate that you actually do have a credi credible and scientifically backed pathway through to decarbonization. So the federal government's been a big help in the last, um, you know, probably the last 12 to 24 months, definitely the last 12 months, in setting some pretty significant targets um, and putting some real policy teeth behind decarbonization. You would have heard uh, uh, Labor's commitment to 43% um, uh, target uh, of renewable um, energy by you know, uh, 2030. So they're really, really kind of pushing. 2050 as a, car, a net zero target has really been there for quite a little while. So they've been, you know, that's uh, both coalition and the, and the uh, Labor government have been kind of pushing for that target as well. Um, but we're seeing some big pushes by groups like ARENA and the um, uh, Clean Energy Finance Corporation to put a lot more funds and a lot more money into projects quickly to be able to scale up the technology requirement and the, um, and the renewable requirements of all of these companies to be able to deliver on those net zero and decarbonization projects.
And just a very quick little look around kind of the states and territories, and I'll just dig into a couple of these um, in a moment. We'll kind of move through them fairly quickly so we can get to some, some questions. But the one, one I did want to highlight um, right off the bat is obviously Queensland. So Queensland set a fairly ambitious target just recently um, around their renewable energy. Um, net zero, again, had been there for a little while. 2050 is always really the date people are looking towards net zero. But the targets of 70 and 80% in 2032 and 2035 of renewable energy across the state are um, pretty significant from a base of about 20, 25% right now. Um, there's a guy called Paul Simhauser. Um, he's the uh, uh, CEO of um, uh, PowerLink, and uh, he gives a great talk where he, where he really digs into the numbers and the and um, you know kind of the trajectory behind these claims. He's very confident by that by 2025, Queensland should be in a position to be at about 50% renewable. Um, so we're on a really good trajectory. We're moving you know we're moving pretty quickly, but things like if you've heard uh, if you've read the new energy um, energy and jobs plan, Queensland energy and jobs plan. You would have seen that um, uh, building something like a super grid, which is you know a 1,500 kilometer uh, effectively pipeline for energy between southeast Queensland and, and up close to kind of Mackay Townsville, you know that's that's almost a 20 year project in and of itself, you know, and we're trying to do it in kind of by 2035 to get to the point where we'd you know have that um, that flow of uh, of renewable electricity across the state. So these are pretty ambitious targets. Um, but they're not things that are, are insurmountable if, um, if the government and proponents get their skates on pretty quickly. Some of the interesting ones are like uh, are the pumped hydro, which has really taken off in the last 12 months um, you know, as a significant beyond Tasmania where they've used pumped hydro for a long time. Um, the, the idea of having these pumped hydro um, batteries you know, across the state and across the country have really become part of the um, part of kind of the energy mix that's growing really quickly. Now, if you've um, read anything about pumped hydro, they uh, similar to a, a nuclear facility. They take a lot of time to really build, um, and there's a lot behind them, uh, you know. And uh, I think we're, what we're going to see is we're probably going to see again a bit of a um, an infrastructure and uh, and potentially a, a, you know a knowledge gap in how we actually get these out into market and um, start utilizing that renewable energy quickly. So it's going to take time. Um, but we're in a position now where at least we have a, a plan. There's at least a plan to move forward. And the Queensland government is starting to let packages around this now of work from uh, the initial kind of um, you know, pre-fid work through to um, uh, front-end engineering and design work to get these designed and um, out and deployed as quickly as they can. The other one is these renewable energy zones. You've probably um, heard of state development areas. Um, big one up near Gladstone, um, out, out to Naldoga, um, which is kind of north of, the, uh, north of the port and up towards the Rio Tinto facility there. Um, areas like that and a little bit more broadly around that SDA are becoming these renewable energy zones. Banana's got one, we've got one down here. There's a number of these across the state and across the country. And the idea behind them is they're really a decentralized production area for producing everything from wind to large batteries to, to big solar arrays um, that then can feed into the grid and, um, and provide us with, uh, with renewable energy across the state. So those, those res are, are really becoming a popular way for us to be able to um, go through the planning process and provide some significant powers to the, to the government and the minister to be able to fast track these projects into the market. A couple other ones. Um, New South Wales, 50% by 2030, net zero again by 2050. Number of different reses across the state as well being developed, um, which, are, which are excellent. I think one big thing out of uh, New South Wales really pushing in the hydrogen space, um, and particularly around how they're going to bring hydrogen projects from, um, or hydrogen from other states into the uh, energy mix within the state. ACT has been at 100% renewable energy since 2020. Um, so they've, uh, they've been able to buy in through power purchase agreements and some of their own production um, renewable energy. They're at a point where they're now looking at this thing called a big, ba a big battery, um, which is effectively people that have batteries or solar arrays on their, their houses throughout the suburbs. Um, you actually get to a point where you can uh, utilize a lot of that energy across, across you know, a bigger footprint of houses to be able to produce um, the amount of renewable energy needed to be able to get them above 100%. So um, these kind of big batteries or community batteries are things that you'll hear a lot more talked about. And battery manufacturers are going through the roof. We'll talk a little bit later about a, a company from uh, Australia working you know, over, in, over in America as well as here in Australia, um, working towards gigafactories, which is a Tesla term that um, Elon Musk must have come, a, come up on Twitter with at some point. But um, the idea of a gigafactory or being able to produce as many batteries as possible um, to, uh, to kind of satiate the, the need for batteries across um, the suburbs, which is going to go really fast in the next few years as that technology, technology comes down in price, similar to what solar panels came down. 
Victoria, again, 50% by 2030. Um, Victoria, again, a big battery. These are um, centralized batteries. So South Australia put in the biggest, biggest battery in the world a few years ago after they went through a particularly um, uh, bleak period of brownouts uh, down there when the, um, the grid crashed. These log large batteries have about 300, this particular one, 300 and 240 megawatts of, of uh, potential capacity and 450 megawatts and 480 megawatt hours of, um, of actual energy production. So these are really, really kind of world-beating big batteries. Some of these batteries are these areas where they're going to build batteries in the renewable energy zones are going to get up into gigawatts. So, you know, you can imagine when we start thinking about gigawatts of battery um, potential capacity, you're talking about a, a heck of a lot of materials coming out of some kind of supply chain, such, lith such as lithium and precious metals being dug up from somewhere. Um, the steel that goes into you know, producing the wind farms and the solar panels required to actually produce the renewable energy to then be fed into those and stored in those batteries. Those are significant value chains that um, uh, businesses across you know, both our accounting, the accounting world and the legal world and our risk advisor world um, are all part of the value chain of. And Tasmania has just been kicking up well above their weight for a long time. 200 um, is their target. They want to get up to producing enough renewable energy that they're actually exporting it outside of um, the state, which is pretty impressive. And they've spun up this climate, renewable climate and future industries, this RecFit um, advisory group to kind of help them become the, uh, one of the leaders globally in terms of renewable energy production and um, export. South Australia, similar story. I just mentioned them. Um, they really got their skates on. Um, you know, to get that battery in place pretty, pretty quickly after uh, some of their, their grid-related issues and challenges, um, but uh, obviously pushing again towards that um, 2050 goal of net zero across the state. And Western Australia, really interesting, the interesting one out of our whole group, um, in that they actually haven't set a, a particular renewable goal yet. They've got their net zero 2050 objective, but they haven't put in place a renewable objective yet across the state. Um, although they, they will certainly have to do that pretty soon to be able to um, have a credible path through to, to net zero. And the Northern Territory, um, this is a, a really interesting um, project out of the Northern Territory, that last dot point there about the Sun Cable. Um, has anybody heard of the Sun Cable? No? Yeah. yeah? Okay, excellent. So the Sun Cable effectively is a piece of infrastructure between the Northern Territory and Singapore that will be built. So a big cable, as it says, under the ground, um, under the sorry under the water, which will um, provide renewable electricity from big solar arrays over to Singapore, and Singapore will then be the off taker of that um, of all of that renewable energy from uh, from northern from the northern territory sun cable development. So that would be a world leading renewable energy um, production project. Uh, it's uh, obviously kind of going through its financial investment decision. Actually, I think it's gone past its its feed and it's in its feed now. Um, so it's being designed. It's in a point where it, uh, you know, hopefully it'll get up. But uh, that's this is an absolutely world-beating project. And you can see those numbers are just eye-watering. There, you know, 17 to 20 gigawatts um, of uh, of electricity, kind of energy storage, and then and then production and export out of the state, which will obviously would be a big, massive windfall for the state, but also um, for a a, um, a country like Singapore, who's trying to decarbon wants to decarbonize really quickly. Um, it's an opportunity in a fairly landlocked state without a, um, uh, you know, enough space to put in big wind farms or, or solar arrays. Um, it'll be an opportunity for them to be able to put downward pressure on their national um, carbon, carbon accounts um, through the, the import and offtake of, um, of power, renewable energy. So what does it mean for your clients? Well, um, I mean, one thing is that the capital intensity, the spending, uh, the intensity of capital spending is going to increase significantly over the next few years. Um, it doesn't really you know, matter where you sit within the value chain. There's going to be um, investment that is needed to be made across your business to be able to get to a point where, um, like I said, if you are a, a uh, part of a production or a value chain for you know, a, larger, a larger player and you supply to them, and when they come and say to you, what does your you know, carbon accounts look like, um, you're going to have to be able to you know, obviously tell them and you're going to have to make sure that it's something that is um, you know, something that's credible and uh, has technology or, or process behind it to allow, allow for their carbon objectives to be, to be met, which is a significant, you know, going to be significant capital and asset um, spending cycle that we're going to go through over the next few years, um, despite potentially a recession um, that's also going to hit us at the same time, which is going to be an interesting, interesting kind of mix. Um, probably actually one of the biggest areas of capital capital spending over the next um, few years in, in a place like Queensland is going to be trying to meet 
the um, objectives of the 2032 Olympics. You know, if you've uh, if you've read anything about the, um, the the Olympics and that concept of climate positivity, um, the idea is that this is the first Olympics that the the um, International Olympic Committee actually has a contract in place for the um, uh, hosting country, uh, hosting region to ensure that they not only uh, get to a net zero carbon net zero, um, but they also get to a point where they're actually sequestering or taking more carbon out of the atmosphere than they than is actually produced by the games. Um, so you're going to have you're going to see some significant investment uh, capital investment um, across across southeast Queensland, but more so across the state very quickly. And that's where the super grid and the decentralized energy renewable energy zones etc come into play because um, it has to really get up get moving for us to get to a position where we actually can get to net zero and then net positive of some kind. So those type of capital spending cycles are going to continue in a place like Queensland. It's a great place to be if you're in the renewable game. Um, reputation, so obviously social license to operate um, for companies like, and I'll, I'll use uh, kind of the AGL example again, um, you know, obviously they, they probably are sitting in a place of, of uh, deficit in terms of their social license. Um, not having a credible plan or a credible um, contribution to decarbonization will put you in a position where um, you could be prosecuted in the court of public appeals. Um, in the newspapers, etc., and that's going to continue to happen um, for companies. Um, but uh, you know, the ones that are kind of forward-thinking and get on the front foot around their plans, the way that they message and, and speak to a certain narrative around decarbonization, will certainly be ahead of the pack. Definitely increased investment opportunities um, across the carbon value chain, and uh, significant market disruptions. Um, in terms of the type of technology that we're going to see coming into the market in Australia, but also the, um, uh, the, the actual deployment and use of that technology. So transforming kind of a risk into an opportunity. So it sound, this sound, all sounds kind of like doom and gloom for a company. You know, it, you know, I guess you can, you're kind of assuming that this is something that's going to really create a lot of headaches for the board. Um, well, we're actually not seeing that. So the, comp the organizations that we work with, um, the board, and particularly the boards that we provide advice through to, are seeing net zero as a real um, a positive and an opportunity for their organization. And in many cases, that's the result of them identifying that you know, material challenge for them as an organization into the future is being able to come up with a um, you know, credible uh, business model that um, allows for a, uh, you know, an environmental and socially just, just world. Um, and that includes everything, and you know, I haven't mentioned things like um, like jobs, for example, within this. You know, obviously we're seeing a, there's a significant pressure on you know on skilled workforces and jobs at this time. Um, but companies, you know, forward-thinking boards are really considering this transition into into a, a net zero future as an opportunity to create you know a new skilled up workforce, um, to create new pathways into you know apprentices and trades, um, to identify you know new technology. Uh, types that will actually require skills that we don't even have today or the accentuation of you know, engineering or, or data skills that will be needed in the future. So the, the clever board is getting, getting um, fairly mature around their understanding of net zero and decarbonization and the material risks that it presents um, as, a, as an organization, but also those, those opportunities for strategic decisions that actually align with um, you know, the way that the world's heading from a decarbonization perspective. The value chain approach I've talked about quite a bit and that, you know, that concept, again, of scope one, two, and three emissions and sitting somewhere, you know, the business is sitting somewhere within that kind of value chain um, is an area that's going to just continue to proliferate. Um, scope, I've got a great, uh, I didn't put it into this one because it's, uh, it's kind of more of an engineering focused um, uh, slide that, you know, gives you a bit of a visual. But um, if you can imagine um, an amoeba. All right, well, there's a bit of science for you. If you imagine like an amoeba, um, and uh, you've got one amoeba, and that could be, let's say, a single company. Well, if you, if you take that one amoeba and you gave a million of them around it, and you just created this entire world, that's, and connected them all together, that's effectively what a scope three emissions um, chain looks like. It's every single amoeba contributing to another amoeba, moving them around, sending them in different, pla in different ways around the, um, you know, around the body or whatever it happens to be. That, that kind of really complex environment or systems is, is exactly what scope three is like. And it's, a, it's an area that, um, again, will take, take a significant amount of skill upskilling in terms of the understanding of how to utilize that value chain. But as companies start to figure out which amoebas actually shift the dial for them, so um, if it happens to be a, you know, a car, a, an a electricity production plant over here that helps a, car ma or a, um, a bottle manufacturing plant to produce a product that's lower emission over here, 
and then that's transported over here. And all of those little scope three emissions moving around, all of those become that systemic kind of focus. And the companies that really get smart about their, their systemic strategic plans are the ones that are going to be um, you know, really ahead of the pack in the future. And tone from the top, um, we're going to talk about disclosures. There'll be some questions, I'm sure, coming out about that. Um, you know, the disclosure environment is rapidly changing. The European Union overnight, I think just um, based on the news I saw this morning, um, just passed through a new disclosure regime around um, the, effectively what they want to see from uh, climate-related disclosures from a corporate space. Um, there was about 15,000 companies that were ca captured within that initial disclosure regime. Um, off the back of the, the changes in it, um, there'll be about 50,000 companies. So you can see that that, that, um, that system has expanded significantly in terms of how they're going to have to work together to be able to not only disclose effectively by understanding their scope through emission portfolio, but also to be able to um, drive, you know, drive that down and be able to um, you know, find a credible path through their decarbonization goals. So a couple of uh, cases, case studies and conversation. I might, uh, Andrew, Andrew, maybe get you to kick off with a, a potential question. Um, before, just before we do that, there's three companies that we put up here. Um, a couple of them will be known, I think, to the, uh, to the group. Um, there's Magnus Technologies, which is a really interesting one in terms of the lithium, lithium batteries and uh, gigafactories in the US and over here in Townsville. Um, there's an engineering company that we put up here just as an example. And uh, I put a future, uh, this uh, national transport and infrastructure company I've been working through. Um, and I'm going to kind of point to these as some examples as I as answer questions, because I think they'll cover quite a bit of the questions that we have. No, no, you're spot on, Angie. You're doing well. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> methane, methane production. So the yeah, yeah. That, no, well, the industrial agriculture has, has um, created a challenge out of them, right? Because they, particularly the way they're fed. So where they used to be fed, you um, know, in, in a fairly kind of natural grassland. Now the amount of um, uh, production of fertilizers put into the, you know, to produce the feed, the type of feed that's given to cows, and and to, um, you know, and to. Yeah, the animals across the board is increasing the amount of methane production that cows. So when they fart, that's that's a that is considered a carbon emission. So a car CO two equivalent is made up of a bunch of different gases, and methane happens to be one of them. If you reduced, if you created a different type of food for cows, you could actually put downward production. I think the numbers are around forty percent through them eating more naturally than they do now. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think for, um, and we do, we do work with uh, engineering companies and risk advisory. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the biggest things for them is um, around their skill base. And so for, you know, obviously engineering is a skill that's in demand. Um, uh, but traditional engineers that would be, you know, infrastructure engineers, et cetera, are really starting to um, upskill in things like re uh, renewable energy, um, natural capital. In fact, one, just to use another example of an engineering company we do work with, it's a bit of a bigger one, but um, Oricon is a partner of ours, um, and they are bringing on uh, almost an entire, uh, you know, group of people that are just going to focus on natural capital. Um, and the value chain of natural capital. And for them, for an engineer, um, the skill in that is they may, let's say they build a dam, right? Um, it's understanding not only the, um, the engineering of, of, you know, the structural engineering of producing a dam, but also the value of the, the water that comes into that dam and goes out of it and being able to, to understand that value chain, monotonize it, put a proxy value on it, and, um, and then be able to, uh, you know, provide that as, as advice to the client as well. So clients are going to start asking for not only, you know, the engineering around the dam, but also the understanding of what the, the product that goes through that dam water is and that piece of natural capital is actually in terms of value to them. What did you identify as a, um, were there any risks ide identified for the company? Risks. Yes, yeah, financial, financial risks. say that yeah, hopefully in the next two years uh, with this new technology it's 
99% renewable. So at the moment, uh, leaving battery, Tesla should go to how to renew their used battery. So this with new technology that Dr. Winston Green, the Nobel Prize back in 2020, no, back in 19, which is 99% renewable. So, but let's see what happens. Victoria government actually also invests in this technology. They just recently announced as well. That's fascinating. That uh, concept of circular, kind of the circular economy, and that's going to be a huge issue um, in supply chains in the future. Um, uh, part of the other, the out the other end of scope three emissions is the is the deconstruction, um, recycling, reuse, reproduction of materials and things like uh, solar panels and we, and you know and wind farms and a lot of years from now. But solar panels certainly are getting towards their kind of twenty year lifespan across many parts of Australia, um, and there are there are companies spinning up right now around um, uh, you know collecting used and you know decommissioned solar panels recycling them and putting the products from the solar panels back into back into circulation so that um, that concept of circular economy is going to be one that's going to drive a lot of company um, strategic decisions as well in the future Australia actually does have a product stewardship um, scheme that was put in place particularly focused on tires um, a number of number of years ago quite a few governments ago. Um, never really has it's never really had any teeth, but the idea behind it was um, extended what's called extended producer take back requirements, which um, means that someone produced a tire, um, let's say it's Yokohama, uh, that Yokohama part of their social compact um, would be to take that tire back at the end of its life to deconstruct it and to produce um, perhaps a new tire out of it or another product. Um, there's some great companies in, you know, in and around Australia that are doing using, you know kind of high temperature, high heat, high temperature, high pressure um, systems like one called pyrolysis that's used quite readily um, to take tires right now and produce a, um, a biochar or a biofuel out of it or a, syn a synthetic gas out of the tires. And then that becomes something that goes back into, a, into the manufacture of um, either more tires or something else. So that circular, uh, circular economy concept you're going to hear a lot about going forward. The only other comment on that one too was um, the reason I asked about risk Obviously, lithium and, and any kind of production material right now, um, within you know pretty constrained supply chains, is going to be a significant risk for companies. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a um, a uh, waste to waste to energy company, a waste to, to fuel synthetic fuel company, and the biggest challenge that we had was uh, security of supply through um, uh, through our contracts of uh, of the material that we needed to produce the produce the fuel and offtake agreements. Offtake agreements actually wasn't the biggest the biggest challenge, but sh certainly the feedstock agreements, long term um, with a you know price floor um, that uh, you know sorry a price ceiling and floor, um, but yeah long term security of supply and and, uh, and a standard price over a number of years were really difficult things to negotiate. And companies are going to have a lot of pressure on them to um, and they're going to need a lot of advice around uh, around how to man you know manage those types of challenges. There is. That's right. Yeah. The um, so a couple of years ago, uh, there was a bunch of bodies. Um, one was the integrated reporting out of South Africa, um, uh, and you know, a few others have come together with that integrated reporting group. Um, you probably heard of SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. So those those groups um, a couple of years ago uh, started talking and effectively um, under the banner of IFRS, bringing them all together. Um, they've they've uh, formed the International Sustainable Standards Board, which effectively is putting together standards right now around non-financial disclosures under under the IFRS banner. Very first time um, that we've ever had uh, fairly harmonious standards coming together that will be um, looked upon as globally leading standards. So I think that's a, it's a really exciting space. It's changing very quickly. So the European Union example that I used before is actually not um, aligned with IFRS. They utilize and they're creating their own set of standards. So even though we've got a you know fairly globally recognized um, foundation like uh, IFRS there, and we've got a, a sustainability standards board developing standards that should be globally used in climate change and ESG reporting disclosures, um, you've still got um, entire 
kind of nation states or groups of nation states that are still trying to make their own. That'll always be the challenge. And that's, a, again, another huge area of advice for clients is around uh, you know, financial and non-financial disclosures and how they actually are going to start um, becoming almost integrated in the reporting cycle. Um, the, European, the Europeans, um, they, they call that driver of that double, me, double materiality. So effectively, the financial materiality um, coming together with the environmental and social materiality and forming a single way of reporting, that integrated reporting style. So that that's, that's, will continue to proliferate, and um, hopefully within the next year or so, we should see those standards that, the, um, that IFRS has put together through the ISSB um, come out of the consultation phase. I actually think they're in the last phase of consultation now and become um, recognized standards globally. Probably not compulsory yet in a place like Australia, um, but certainly ones that uh, you know, kind of leading companies will start looking to as driving their disclosures. We've had um, clients that have received letters from ASIC regarding their um, OFR disclosures already yeah. around climate risk and, um, and yeah, effectively not sufficiently detailing the risks around climate change and uh, mm -hmm. their mining related companies. So although the standards aren't out per se, it's covered under the OFR or climate yeah. risk, so, mm -hmm. which gives us opportunities um, we're looking at possibly partnering with um, ESG consulting firms effectively where they'll um, provide effectively the ESG plan and um, we can utilise our, our audit um, and skill up our audit team to kind of, you know, we love checklists so effectively, um, you know, uh, ensure that they're effectively following these processes and, um, and yeah, access to capital as well with all the equity investment mm -hmm. and the like. Couldn't agree more. APRA and ASIC have both been posturing very clearly. There's a survey, an APRA survey that was, um, uh, you know, non non obligatory, but um, was was uh, obviously people were told that it's probably a good idea to, to submit it, um, and uh, and that was all about climate related financial disclosures and the understanding of what companies were doing across the financial space and superannuation particularly, obviously with. Um, with their disclosures, and and particularly looking at like due diligence for ESG, um, you know, is becoming huge, huge business. For us at at Ashurst, one of the things the risk advisory is doing quite a bit of right now is um, trying to identify how we can um, do, deliver control uplifts, um, risk control uplifts for companies, so that they don't find themselves in litigation and dispute environments really, really quickly. And the lawyers are kind of happy for. The advice to go through from them of you know how they meet the their legal requirements, but then when it comes to actually delivering it or operationalizing on the ground, so they don't end up in a litigation or dispute, um, that's again a, a huge blind spot for for companies right now. And many don't have kind of the um, uh, the training or the understanding of, of ESG due diligence to be able to clearly identify the risks and understand the control environment that's needed to be able to manage them. And it doesn't help that there isn't unified obligations under an act or, you know, or a compliance regime that actually they can just use the checklist and go, doot, 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 we're compliant, you know, it's not easy. And please, I know that you'll all go to the fact I was on the board of you hope for 22 years. So forget that. I have retired. I'm not on the board of you hope. And this has got to do nothing with you hope. One, reputation can go the other way. If you go overboard too much on this, this stuff at the moment, you're running against the US and Germany. Two big factors in this area, and France. Secondly, none of the batteries have worked properly. The amount of energy needed, the number of batteries, what's inside the battery has not been looked at yet. And most of the batteries in southern Australia that have been put in have been run by products out of Sri Lanka. Hello, look at the cricket team. <laughs> 
third point was, I think everybody should try to get a copy in the last six or eight weeks, you probably know better than I on this, of the NASA report that's been kept under lock and key for 30 years. That NASA report's three, three pages it's been broken down into and just talks against any human action in regard to climate change. So you should get that. And the last point is there's been an article recently in the Fin Review, I think it was. I, I read the article, but I didn't find it. I think Drew Townsend was he here. That'd be right. Don't pay me. <laughs> <laughs> where they run through what would happen in terms of electricity in this basis with us all going to this new world. Fascinating. There were only two units in the block with electric cars that could possibly get filled up every day out of the 38 unit block. And then they went through every part of energy with that. Now, your comments on waste with energy is all true, mm -hmm. but there are a long way to go there. Mm -hmm. And so far, there's only one waste area where they've been able to work the energy, and that's with plastics. So, you know, can you all think of every garbage tip and people going through trying to find plastics? I mean, it, this is a much bigger area than people realise, and it's a great one for the young. I'm the oldest here, so I can say that. And it's also a great thing for the politicians. So I just say to you, beware, especially for accountants and lawyers on reputation. Nothing's been proved absolutely perfect yet. And in the battery area, I do have a lot of experience. And none of them have been able to guarantee to be able to put it all together. If you come up with one, please let me know. It'll be a good buy on the stock market. <laughs> please be aware. Yeah. I think they're very fair comments. And um, uh, you'll notice I didn't say anywhere in here not to get to take something out of the energy mix. I think that's a, it's a very, it's a very, they're poignant points in that regardless of our decarbonization journey we're going to be going on to, um, it's not going to mean getting rid of coal or getting rid of gas or you know reducing our um, our need and requirement for energy for cheap energy and the challenge that the challenge that companies are going to have right now particularly from the energy perspective is actually being able to still grow while putting um, decoupling from their emissions profile right and that's that's going to be a huge that's going to be a huge challenge so I couldn't agree with you more there are there also are a lot of questions around technology and the technology pathway and a technocentric kind of view of just relying on the new batteries or the new technology is probably again not going to be something that is going to be the perfect magic bullet for any of this. Um, what about the people that are working the coal mines? They're going to close down every coal mine in Queensland, every mm. coal mine in New South Wales. Just take Queensland and New mm. South Wales. What major regional towns will be closed down? How many people out of work? Come on. By 50, you've got to be joking. You'll close down Newcastle. You'll close down Wollongong. And what are you going to be closing down up here? Major regional towns will be closed down. There'll be so many people out of work. Because that's what they're talking about. The Labor Party are talking about closing down the coal mines. Do you guys realise every bank except one it's closed down dealing with the coal mines. Right, because it's come to WA, we'll let you keep the lithium out of the ground. <laughs> well, there you are. We'll all, yeah. you can import us all. They if wouldn't. I'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, might be it, it, it wouldn't be a Horn Chadwick conference without Fearless. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's another 
another side to it. There is. There's always that. Exactly. And I couldn't agree with you more. There's always another side. And it's quite, it's a, like I said, it's a poignant point. You can't forget the, you can't take your eye off the, the need of your clients and the value that they, that they produce. And if that means that um, the strategy is something that is going to go against, you know, their value production unit, then, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to weigh it up. So I couldn't agree more. Everybody should try and get that NASA report. Yeah, I haven't, I actually haven't read that myself. So. absolute beauty. Okay. And it's been kept under lock and key for 30 years. Um, 